Hello, and welcome to the final report on January 6th, a reading. I am your host and narrator, Robert Keniston. This is episode 12. In this episode, we continue with President Trump's last stand as a mob of his supporters descend upon the Capitol to stop the certification of the 2020 presidential election. So, without further ado, let's begin. Hope Hicks texted Trump campaign spokesperson Hogan Gidley in the midst of the January 6th violence, explaining that she had suggested several times on the preceding days, January 4th and January 5th, that President Trump publicly state that January 6th must remain peaceful and that he had refused her advice to do so. Her recollection was that Hirschman earlier advised President Trump to make a preemptive public statement in advance of January 6th, calling for no violence that day. No such statement was made. The District of Columbia Homeland Security Office explicitly warned that groups were planning to occupy the Capitol to halt the vote. We got derogatory information from OSINT suggesting that some very, very violent individuals were organizing to come to D.C. And not only were they organized to come to D.C., but they were, these groups, these non-aligned groups, were aligning. And so all the red flags went up at that point. You know, when you have armed militia, you know, collaborating with white supremacy groups, collaborating with conspiracy theory groups online, all toward a common goal, you start seeing what we call in, you know, terrorism, a blended ideology. And that's a very, very bad sign. Then when they were clearly across, not just across one platform, but across multiple platforms of these groups coordinating, not just like chatting, hey, how's it going? What's the weather like where you're at? But like, what are you bringing? What are you wearing? You know, where do we meet up? Do you have plans for the Capitol? That's like pre-operational intelligence, right? And that is something that's clearly alarming. Again, this type of intelligence was shared, including obvious warnings about potential violence prior to January 6th. What was not shared and was not fully understood by intelligence and law enforcement entities is what role President Trump would play on January 6th in exacerbating the violence and later refusing for multiple hours to instruct his supporters to stand down and leave the Capitol. No intelligence collection was apparently performed on President Trump's plans for January 6th, nor was there any analysis performed on what he might do to exacerbate potential violence. Certain Republican members of Congress who were working with Trump and the Giuliani team may have had insight on this particular risk, but none appear to have alerted the Capitol Police or any other law enforcement authority. On January 2, 2021, Katrina Pearson wrote in an email to fellow rally organizers, POTUS expectations are to have something intimate at the ellipse and call on everyone to march to the Capitol. And, on January 4th, 2021, another rally organizer texted Mike Lindell, the MyPillow CEO, that President Trump would unexpectedly call on his supporters to march to the Capitol. This stays only between us. It could also not get out about the march because I will be in trouble with the National Park Service and all the agencies, but POTUS is going to just call for it, quote, unexpectedly. Testimony obtained by the committee also indicates that President Trump was specifically aware that the crowd he had called to Washington was fired up and angry on the evening of January 5th. Judd Deere, a Deputy White House Press Secretary, recalled a conversation with President Trump in the Oval Office on the evening of January 5th. Judd Deere, I said he should focus on policy accomplishments. I didn't mention the 2020 election. Committee staff, okay. What was his response? Dear, he acknowledged that and said, we've had a lot, something along those lines, but didn't, he fairly quickly moved to how fired up the crowd is or was going to be. Committee staff, okay, what did he say about it? Dear, just that they were, they were fired up. They were angry. They feel like the election has been stolen, that the election was rigged, that He went on and on about that for a little bit. Testimony indicated that President Trump was briefed on the risk of violence on the morning of the 6th before he left the White House. Cassidy Hutchinson provided this testimony. 
Vice Chair Cheney. So, Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that Mr. Onado told the President about weapons at the rally on the morning of January 6th? Hutchinson, this is what Mr. Onado relayed to me. The head of President Trump's security detail, Bob Engel, told the Select Committee that when he shared critical information with White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Anthony Ornato, it was a means of conveying that information with the Oval Office. I, my assumption was that it would get to the Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, or that he was sharing the information with the Chief. I don't, and the filtering process, or if the Chief thinks it needs to get to the President, then he would share it with the President. Also, Engel confirmed that if information would come to my attention, whether it was a protective intelligence issue or concern, or primarily I would, I would make sure that the information got filtered up through the appropriate chain, usually through Mr. Arnato. So if I received a report on something that was happening in the DC area, I'd either forward that information to Mr. Arnato or call him about the information and communicate in some way. The select committee also queried Deputy Chief of Staff Ornato this November about what he generally would have done in this sort of situation, asking him the following. Generally, you receive information about things like the groups that are coming, the stuff that we talked earlier. You would bring that to Mr. Meadows and likely did here, although you don't have specific recollection. Ornato responded, that is correct, sir. Ornato also explained to the committee that, in my normal daily functions, in my general functions as my job, I would have had a conversation with him about all the groups coming in and what was expected from the Secret Service. As for the morning of January 6th itself, he had the following answer. Committee staff, do you remember talking to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows about your concerns about the threat landscape going into January 6th? Ornato, I don't recall. However, in my position, I would have made sure he was tracking the demos, which he received a daily brief, presidential briefing. So he most likely was getting all of this in his daily briefing as well. I wouldn't know what was in his intelligence briefing that day, but I would have made sure that he was tracking these things and just mentioned, hey, are you tracking the demos? If he gave me a yeah, I don't recall it that day, but I'm sure that was something that took place. Bernardo had access to intelligence that suggested violence at the Capitol on January 6th, and it was his job to inform Meadows and President Trump of that. Although Ornato told us that he did not recall doing so, the Select Committee found multiple parts of Ornato's testimony questionable. The Select Committee finds it difficult to believe that neither Meadows nor Ornato told President Trump, as was their job, about the intelligence that was emerging as the January 6th rally approached. Hours before the Ellipse rally on January 6th, the fact that the assembled crowd was prepared for potential violence was widely known. In addition to intelligence reports indicating potential violence at the Capitol, weapons and other prohibited items were being seized by police on the streets and by Secret Service at the magnetometers for the Ellipse speech. Secret Service confiscated a haul of weapons from the 28,000 spectators who did pass through the magnetometers. 242 canisters of pepper spray, 260 knives or blades, 18 brass knuckles, 18 tasers, 6 pieces of body armor, 3 gas masks, 30 batons or blunt instruments, and 17 miscellaneous items like scissors, needles, or screwdrivers. And thousands of others purposely remained outside the magnetometers or left their packs outside. Others brought firearms. Three men in fatigues from Broward County, Florida, brandished AR-15s in front of the Metropolitan Police Officers on 14th Street and Independence Avenue on the morning of January 6th. MPD advised over the radio that one individual was possibly armed with a Glock at 14th and Constitution Avenue, and another was possibly armed with a rifle at 15th and Constitution Avenue around 11.23 a.m. The National Park Service detained an individual with a rifle between 12 and 1 p.m. Almost all of this was known before Donald Trump took the stage at the Ellipse. By the time President Trump was preparing to give his speech, he and his advisors knew enough to cancel the rally. 
and he certainly knew enough to cancel any plans for a march to the Capitol. According to testimony obtained by the Select Committee, President Trump knew that elements of the crowd were armed and had prohibited items, and that many thousands would not pass through the magnetometers for that reason. Testimony indicates that the President had received an earlier security briefing, and testimony indicates that the Secret Service mentioned the prohibited items again as they drove President Trump to the ellipse. Cassidy Hutchinson was with the President backstage. Her contemporaneous text messages indicate that President Trump was effing furious about the fact that a large number of his supporters would not go through the magnetometers. Cassidy Hutchinson, but the crowd looks good from this vantage point. As long as we get the shot, he was fucking furious. Tony Ornato, he doesn't get it that people on the monument side don't want to come in. They can see from there and don't want to come in. They can see from there and don't have to go through the mags, with 30,000 magged inside. Cassidy Hutchinson. That's what was relayed several times and in different iterations. Cassidy Hutchinson. Poor Max got chewed out. Cassidy Hutchinson. He also kept mentioning an off-the-record trip to Capitol before he took the stage. Tony Ornato. Bobby will tell him no. It's not safe to do so. No assets available to safely do it. And Hutchinson described what President Trump said as he prepared to take the stage. When we were in the offstage announce area tent behind the stage, he was very concerned about the shot, meaning the photograph that we would get because the rally space wasn't full. One of the reasons, which I previously stated, was because he wanted it to be full and for people to not feel excluded because they had come far to watch him at the rally and he felt the mags were at fault for not letting everybody in. But another leading reason, and likely the primary reasons, is because he wanted it full, and he was angry that we weren't letting people through the mags with weapons. What the Secret Service deemed as weapons, and are, are weapons. But when we were in the offstage announce tent, I was part of a conversation. I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing mags away. The Secret Service special agent who drove the president after his speech told the select committee that Trump made a similar remark in the vehicle when his demand to go to the Capitol was refused. Essentially that Trump did not believe his supporters posed a risk to him personally. Minutes after the exchange that Hutchinson described when President Trump took the stage, he pointedly expressed his concerns about the thousands of attendees who would not enter the rally area and instructed Secret Service to allow that part of the crowd to enter anyway. I'd love to have if those tens of thousands of people would be allowed. The military, the Secret Service, and we want to thank you and the police law enforcement. Great, but I'd love it if they could be allowed to come up here with us. Is that possible? Can you just let them come up, please? Although President Trump and his advisors knew of the risk of violence and knew specifically that elements of the crowd were angry and some were armed, from intelligence and law enforcement reports that morning, President Trump nevertheless went forward with the rally and then specifically instructed the crowd to march to the Capitol. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. You have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated lawfully slated. Much of President Trump's speech was improvised. Even before his improvisation, during the review of President Trump's prepared remarks, White House lawyer Eric Hirschman specifically requested that if there were any factual allegations, someone needed to independently validate or verify the statements. And in the days just before January 6, Hirschman chewed out John Eastman and told him he was out of his effing mind to argue that the vice president could be the sole decision maker as to who becomes the next president. Hirschman told us, I so berated him that I believed that the theory would not go forward. But President Trump made that very argument during his speech at the Ellipse and made many false statements. Hirschman attended that speech, but walked out during the middle of it. President Trump's speech to the crowd that day lasted more than an hour. The speech walked through dozens of known falsehoods about purported election fraud, 
and Trump again made false and malicious claims about Dominion voting systems. As discussed earlier, he again pressured Mike Pence to refuse to count lawful electoral votes, going off script repeatedly, leading the crowd to believe falsely that Pence could and would alter the election outcome. And I actually, I just spoke to Mike. I said, Mike, that doesn't take courage. What takes courage is to do nothing. That takes courage. And then we're stuck with a president who lost the election by a lot, and we have to live with that for four more years. We're just not going to let that happen. When you catch somebody in a fraud, you're allowed to go by very different rules. So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And I hope he doesn't listen to the rhinos and the stupid people that he's listening to. This characterization of Vice President Pence's decision had a direct impact on those who marched to and approached the Capitol, as illustrated by this testimony from a person convicted of crimes committed on January 6th. So this woman came up to the side of us, and she says, Pence folded. So it was kind of like, okay, well, in my mind, I was thinking, well, that's it, you know. Well, my son-in-law looks at me, and he says, I want to go in. Trump used the word peacefully, written by speechwriters, one time but he delivered many other scripted and unscripted comments that conveyed a different message. Because you'll never go back to our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated. Lawfully slated. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Trump also was not the only rally speaker to do these things. Giuliani, for instance, also said, let's have trial by combat. Likewise, Eastman used his two minutes on the ellipse stage to make a claim already known to be false, that corrupted voting machines stole the election. The best indication of the impact of President Trump's words, both during the ellipse speech and beforehand, are the comments from those supporters who attended the ellipse rally and their conduct immediately thereafter. Video clips show several of the attendees on their way to the Capitol, or shortly after they arrive. I'm telling you what, I'm hearing that Pence, hearing that Pence just caved. No. Is that true? I didn't hear it. I'm, hear I'm hearing reports that Pence caved. No way. I'm telling you, if Pence caved, we're going to drag motherfuckers through the streets. You fucking politicians are going to get fucking drugged through the streets. Yes. I guess the hope is that there's such a show of force here that Pence will decide to do the right thing, according to Trump. Pence voted against Trump. Interviewer. Okay, and that's when all this started? Yep, that's when we marched on the Capitol. We just heard that Mike Pence is not going to reject any fraudulent electoral votes. Other speaker. Boo! You're a traitor! Boo! That's right. You heard it here first. Mike Pence has betrayed the United States of America. Other speaker. Boo! Fuck you, Mike Pence. Mike Pence has betrayed this president, and he has betrayed the people of the United States, and we will never, ever forget. Cheers. Question. What percentage of the crowd is going to the Capitol? Answer. Oath Keeper Jessica Watkins. 100%. It has, it, it has spread like wildfire that Pence has betrayed us and everybody's marching on the Capitol. All million of us. It's insane. Another criminal defendant charged with assaulting an officer with a flagpole and other crimes explained in an interview why he went to the Capitol and fought. Dale Huddle. We were not there illegally. We were invited by the president himself. Trump's backers had been told that the election had been stolen. Reporter Megan Hickey. But do you think he encouraged violence? Dale Huddle. Well, I sat there, or stood there, with half a million people listening to his speech. And in that speech, both Giuliani and Trump said we were going to have to fight like hell to save our country. Now, whether it was a figure of speech or not, it wasn't taken that way. Reporter Megan Hickey. You didn't take it as a figure of speech? Dale Huddle. No. President Trump concluded his speech at 1.10 p.m. Among other statements from the Ellipse podium, President Trump informed the crowd that he would be marching to the Capitol with them. Now, it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, 
We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol, and we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women, and we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Hutchinson testified that she first became aware of President Trump's plans to attend Congress's session to count the votes on or about January 2nd. She learned this from a conversation with Giuliani. It's going to be great. The president's going to be there. He's going to look powerful. He's, he's going to be with the members. He's going to be with the senators. Evidence also indicates that multiple members of the White House staff including White House lawyers, were concerned about the president's apparent intentions to go to the Capitol. After he exited the stage, President Trump entered the presidential SUV and forcefully expressed his intention that Bobby Engel, the head of his Secret Service detail, direct the motorcade to the Capitol. The committee has now obtained evidence from several sources about a furious interaction in the SUV. The vast majority of witnesses who have testified before the Select Committee about this topic including multiple members of the Secret Service, a member of the Metropolitan Police, and national security and military officials in the White House, describe President Trump's behavior as irate, furious, insistent, profane, and heated. Hutchinson heard about the exchange secondhand and related what she heard in our June 28, 2022 hearing from Ornato, as did another witness, a White House employee with national security responsibilities, who shared that Ornato also recounted to him President Trump's irate behavior in the presidential vehicle. Other members of the White House staff and Secret Service also heard about the exchange after the fact. The White House employee with national security responsibilities gave this testimony. Committee staff, but it sounds like you recall some rumor or some discussion around the West Wing about the president's anger about being told that he couldn't go to the Capitol. Is that right? Employee. So Mr. Ornato said that he was angry that he couldn't go right away. In the days following that, I do remember, you know, again, hearing again how angry the president was when, you know, they were in the limo. But beyond specifics of that, that's pretty much the extent of the cooler talk. The committee has regarded both Hutchinson and the corroborating testimony by the White House employee with national security responsibilities as earnest and has no reason to conclude that either had a reason to invent their accounts. A Secret Service agent who worked on one of the details in the White House and was present in the Ellipse motorcade had this comment. Committee staff. Ms. Hutchinson has suggested to the committee that you sympathized with her after her testimony and believed her account. Is that accurate? Special agent. I have no... Yeah, that's accurate. I have no reason. I, I mean, we, we became friends. We worked. I worked every day. I worked every day with her for six months. Yeah, she became a friend of mine. We had a good working relationship. I have no reason that she's never done me wrong. She never lied that I know of. The committee's principal concern was that the president actually intended to participate personally in the January 6th efforts at the Capitol, leading the attempt to overturn the election either from inside the House chamber, from a stage outside the Capitol, or otherwise. The committee regarded those facts as important because they are relevant to President Trump's intent on January 6th. There is no question from all the evidence assembled that President Trump did have that intent. As it became clear that Donald Trump desired to travel to the Capitol on January 6th, a White House security official in the White House complex became very concerned about his intentions. To be completely honest, we were all in a state of shock. It just, one, one, I think the actual physical feasibility of doing it, and then also we all knew what that implicated and what that meant, that this was no longer a rally, that this was going to move to something else if he physically walked to the Capitol. I, I don't know what you want to, I don't know if you want to use the word insurrection, coup, whatever. We all knew that this would move from a normal democratic, you know, public event into something else. President Trump continued to push to travel to the Capitol even after his return to the White House, despite knowing that a riot was underway. Kaylee McEnany, the White House press secretary, spoke with President Trump about his desire to go to the Capitol after he returned to the White House from the Ellipse. 
So to the best of my recollection, I recall him being wanting to saying that he wanted to physically walk and be a part of the march and then saying that he would ride the beast if he needed to ride in the presidential limo. Later in the afternoon, Mark Meadows relayed to Cassidy Hutchinson that President Trump was still upset that he would not be able to go to the Capitol that day. As he told Hutchinson, the president wasn't happy that Bob Engel didn't pull it off for him and that Mark didn't work hard enough to get the movement on the books. This podcast has been a production of 2008 Studios under a contract with sag -Aftra. The recordings herein are property of 2008 LLC. Any inquiries to collaborate or contact can be sent to info at 2008.com. That's info at 20-08.com. If you enjoyed what you just heard, please feel free to share this podcast. And, of course, please subscribe to be updated on future episodes. Thank you for listening.